Well, first of all, I'd like to um, recognize all of you that have been with us, some of you since Sunday night, um, looking at ways that we can continue to drive life-saving and life-changing innovations, and equally important, reinforce the value that we create, not just to ourselves and our investment portfolios, but also to the human condition. And as we talked about a little bit earlier, um, we are an industry that lives and breathes in an environment that is highly regulated, is dependent on federal investment, is structured in such a way that if we don't properly design and implement our um, world treaties and our terror systems and things like that, we can literally stop innovation in its tracks. So as we go through that process, there are lots of people at the Biotechnology Innovation Organization in Washington, D.C. that not only work every day on Capitol Hill, but also um, keep us up to date at the state level so that we can keep you up to date when grassroots feedback and comments are needed. So with that, I am going to jo join Nick Magalanis. Did I say that right? Yes. And um, Nick and I have our crystal ball right here. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on. We're going to talk a little bit about what might be coming. Um, I will tell you the crystal ball is a little cloudy on what might be coming. Um, and then what I'd like to do um, is open it up so that you guys, after we've had our discussion, um, if you've got some questions. So one of the things I would strongly recommend is that you get close and we get personal. Um, because this may just be one of the most important conversations you hear all day. So um, with that, I'd like to, uh, you know, Nick, as you and I discussed, Jean was expected to come, and she's in their program, so they know all about Jean, but they don't know a whole lot about you. And you've had a pretty broad career on the Hill. Do you want to give us just a little glimpse of that? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me here, and thanks for making it back to the last session to hear me. I you know, flew from D.C., so I'm really looking forward to talking with you all and answering your questions. Um, as, uh, as Joe mentioned, I spent six years on Capitol Hill uh, working for various members. Uh, first, for Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, who's the current chairman of the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. After that, I had a, a stint with Energy and Commerce Committee, which is the principal health care committee in the House uh, with jurisdiction over the FDA and Medicare, Medicaid, and public health programs. Uh, and then I joined uh, the House Republican Conference, which is a leadership office where I worked for Kathy McMorris Rogers, who is still uh, the highest ranking Republican female in Congress. So I was there for about two years as well. Uh, prior to that, uh, I had a stint uh, in finance and investment banking uh, and also worked in government affairs. So. I've kind of had a, a, a broad spectrum of experiences in the healthcare sector, and now I'm the Republican lobbyist for bio, uh, principally lobbying healthcare issues f uh, in the House and Senate. Great. And most importantly, I married into a University of Arizona family. My wife said I must say that when I speak here. <laughs> she was the 33rd person in her family to go to U of A. So wow. bear down. So the... It's funny, you know, when I go to D.C., there, there's so many things and so many projects that are going on, and you've been on just about every major committee that affects our industry. During your staff years on the Hill, what was one of your favorite or most exciting projects that you worked on? That's a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about two experiences. One is not really a healthcare project, um, but was it really, really important and was almost some of the most fun I ever had because it was out of my comfort zone in the healthcare sector. And that was working on something called the ABLE Act, which is, stands for Achieving a Better Life Expectancy. Uh, many of you with children know that you can save in a 527 account for your kid to go to college, you know, tax-free savings. 
uh, until recently, until we passed this law in Congress, uh, if you had a child that was disabled, you could not save tax-free for their care. So uh, we went and over a lot of years, uh, Congressman McMorris Rogers and some other leaders in Congress worked on a piece of legislation that would change the tax laws to allow you to save tax-free so that you know, while your child may never be able to go to college, but you could save tax for their for their lifelong care and their lifelong needs. Uh, that bill was passed into law about two years ago. It's now being implemented in almost all the states. Uh, it was very interesting, it was incredibly fulfilling because this is an, a, a vulnerable population that really needed our help. It was, I think, in many ways an injustice that they couldn't save tax-free uh, and folks that really do need it. So, uh, interesting dynamics with you know, the bill did have a cost associated with it. So negotiating in a very, very bipartisan manner, maybe the, the most bipartisan thing I ever did in Congress, actually, um, you know, to sh see how we can pay for this legislation and to, you know, harmonize the tax laws. And it was really interesting and it was a lot of fun um, and incredibly fulfilling. And, you know, I, I was very fortunate to be a part of a process with my boss, McMorris Rogers, with Senator Burr, Senator Casey, um, from Pennsylvania, just some real top-notch leaders in Congress that really got something very important done. Uh, the other project I worked with a lot at the staff level, uh, you know, I kind of joked that my career in Congress was defined by two bills, Obamacare and Cures, because um, I started working in Congress in late 09, early 2010, which was the peak of the Affordable Care Act, um, and then that kind of stopped all health care legislating for a period of two or three years, and then shortly after, the cures process started. Uh, so I worked at, on cures, you know, from beginning until it passed the House. I left to go to bio about two months after H.R. 6 cleared the House chamber. That was a bill that I think, you know, as many of you know, it's, it's very important. It has a lot of things in there that are, that are really critical to our industry, critical to patients, critical to research. Um, obviously, some strong NIH components, but we also had some big hopes for what we could do on issues like you know, drug development tools, biomarkers, patient-reported outcomes, adaptive clinical trials, you know, things that we really thought could really be game changers. And that was one where it was kind of like a, almost uh, like very aspirational and we really shot, try to shoot the moon and go big and, and really make some big changes and then kind of reality and politics set in a little bit because I think the Cures bill that passed the House, you know, was probably version eight or nine of what we started off with or what the committee started off with in the beginning. Uh, you know, Chairman Upton's staff did a really great job of going to every corner and saying, Which, what, what ideas do you have? What are your ideas? What are your suggestions? How can we help? Um, but those are probably the, the two things I would say that I worked on in Congress that I think I look back on the most fondly. Great. So, um, you, you I, I heard the word bipartisan in there. And um, next Monday night, there's going to be a female leader and a male leader that are going to be sitting down to have a conversation. Um, it may not be as productive as ours. Never know. Uh, you never know. Uh, it probably be, will be more entertaining. Um, but, you know, as we look out towards Monday night, um, what do you think that the attitude is in, um, in D.C.? You know, what are they expecting to come out of Monday night's debate? It's a great question, and I'll choose my words carefully. <laughs> um, I will say whatever D.C. is thinking is probably wrong because they've been wrong. The, we, we have been wrong the entire time. We said Trump couldn't win the primaries. We said Trump wouldn't be the nominee. We said it was going to be Kasich or Rubio or Bush for any number of reasons, and we were wrong. Um, I, I think that Monday night's going to be really interesting. You know, traditionally debates are important, but they're kind of like high risk, little reward. So you can go to the debate, and as long as you say in your talking points and you kind of battle to a draw, people just kind of write it off and say, okay, well, we hit, that was the debate, and, you know, both candidates came away relatively unscathed. They each landed some good punches. Um, I think this is going to be a little different. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it's be, I think they're saying it will be the most watched debate in history. Uh, they're saying it's going to be somewhere around 100 million viewers for this debate, which I think is about even with the Super Bowl. It was more than the Olympics and more than almost everything on TV this year except the Super Bowl, it will be this debate. So when you have that kind of interest, that kind of viewership, um, with I think three quarters of all likely voters watching, uh, 
and so many doubts of both candidates, you know, so many outstanding questions for both candidates, I think this debate could have more of an impact than some other ones have. Um, you know, the, I think the transformational debate that everyone talks about was, you know, Nixon versus JFK, uh, one of the first televised debates, and they say that JFK won that debate because he was better on TV, but Nixon won on the radio. Um, and while this one may not be as transformational, I think this one will be perhaps equally impactful. Uh, just because, you know, Trump, for example, people are going to wonder, can he, is he presidential? Uh, can he be substantive? Can he be on, can he talk policy? Can he be, can he be deep on the issues? Um, I think he can be. You know, I think that he is a smart guy. I think that he will be well prepared to come in and talk substantively about his ideas. Um, but then they're going to ask, well, you know, will, be, will he launch into ad hominem attacks? Will he be, you know, crass? Will he be pushy with, with uh, Secretary Clinton? Um, Secretary Clinton, you know, I think has her own questions to answer. She has had a f kind of a really some bad weeks in the polls. You know, she, the, the past few weeks for her have not been great. Yeah. Um, if you look at the national polling, she was, has gone from, you know, an average of plus eight in the polls to almost even. She's about a point and a half up on average right now. Um, I think that, that you know that, that she's going to have her own kind of questions to address. Obviously, there's the Benghazi stuff. There is the email controversy. Then there's her recent, you know, just kind of uh, misstatements in the press about basket of deplorables or whatever. I think they're both going to have to answer some questions. I think also it'll be curious to see how she handles Mr. Trump's debating style. He isn't a politician. He's by no means normal, like on, on average for what you'll usually hear in a debate. So we'll have to see how she can pivot on what will likely be a very aggressive style he's going to put forward. Um, I will also say that right now, if you kind of look at how the, the state polling is breaking down, the Electoral College, you know, Secretary Clinton has a pretty good lead. It's, I think she has like 293 and he has like 234 for electoral votes. You need 270 to win. Now, there's one state that's up, that's a tie right now. That's Arizona. So make sure you vote. Your vote's going to count. So make sure you go to the polls. Um, Arizona has 11 electoral votes. And then if you take into account, you know, some other states that could be tight, like North Carolina, uh, Nevada, uh, you know, if you take North Carolina, Arizona, and Nevada and put those in the Trump column, all of a sudden he's at 266. So this election becomes a very real, very close, very quickly. You're also seeing the polls tighten in Maine and Pennsylvania. So if he all of a sudden, you know, Mr. Trump's able to hold on to Ohio and Florida where he has decent leads right now and then bring Maine over or bring North Carolina over or Nevada or Arizona, you know, he, this election does get very close. So I, I do think that this election is going to be a tight one. Um, I think that all along pollsters in the inside the Beltway crowd has been wrong on polling because we thought he was not going to win as many primaries as he did nor did we think there were going to be blowouts. I mean, and he went out there and just, you know, really kicked butt in some of these primaries and really surprised some people. So I think there's going to be folks voting in, these, in this election who traditionally don't vote, which means they're traditionally not polled. And I think those folks are going to be in the Trump column. So I, I, I would, you know, I think luckily y'all are on the West Coast, so you won't be up as late as I will be <laughs> on election night, but I think election night is going to be a long, long night. And if I'm wrong, you know, we've been wrong the whole time, so I'm, it's on the call. You know, I, I've told some friends of mine, this is one of the first times that I've ever gone into this particular cycle where I had actually met every one of the candidates at one time or another. It's impressive. There were a lot of them. There were a lot of them. Well, I'm older than you, honey. <laughs> so, you know, during my career, I had an interface with one or the other at different times, and it was, um, it was definitely surprising on the Republican side. Um, Democrats, not so much. But um, definitely a surprise on the Republican side. Um, It's great to say, you know, okay, we, we've got to speculate, and, and I think right now, you know, at the end of the day, you had a great answer, but the reality is, is, you know, who's going to win this election? <laughs> you know, check how the wind is blowing. Um, but between the election and the inauguration, we have the lame duck. And, um, you know, the election may not just affect, I mean, we know that there'll be a new person in the White House, but we could also have new leadership in the House, well, probably in the Senate, more than the House. Um, 
if leadership were to change, how would that change the chairmanship of some of the committees? Sure, so that's a, a great question and one that everyone here should be interested in because it will affect our industry a, a great deal potentially going into a Padufa year. Um, so, you know, one thing that's been kind of like segueing from the presidential conversation has been, well, how will the receptive candidates affect down ticket races? Uh, the Senate is right now up for grabs. You know, I think that we're, Washington Post today reported that we're, the Republicans are slightly favored to hold on to the Senate at this point, but it's gonna be really, really close. Um, the House isn't really in play. Uh, we have, uh, Republicans have 247 seats in the House. It's the largest Republican majority since Hoover. So they can, they're, they're probably gonna lose, I think, between eight and 12 or eight and 15 seats. Uh, that obviously doesn't really threaten their majority. The, the, the real interesting thing will be what happens in the Senate. Uh, right now, Republicans in the Senate have 54 senators. Uh, we have, Republicans have, you know, I think 20 or 24 races right now, and some of those are really close. Uh, Illinois, Senator Kirk, Ron Johnson in Wisconsin, Senator Toomey, Pennsylvania, Senator Ayotte, New Hampshire, Senator Rubio, Florida, Portman, Ohio, Blunt, Missouri, Burn, North Carolina, uh, and McCain in Arizona are all really tight races. And they're along a spectrum, you know. So Wisconsin and Illinois, those are really, really hard for Republicans to hold on to. Then you have Ohio and Florida and Arizona in some ways, where the senators have done really, really good jobs, running great campaigns, and they're hopeful that they'll hang on to those seats. And then you have, you know, Missouri and North Carolina, where those are tighter than we had hoped for and tighter than we expected we being Republicans, sorry. Uh, and then you have kind of a, some toss-up races where you have Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, and a couple others where, and also Indiana now, the Senator Bai is running, for real, running again, coming back, um, where it, the, the, the fate of the Senate chamber really is up for grabs. And if Republicans lose the Senate, then the Democrats get the gavels. They get to take back over and chair the committees. Now, this is important because there is some jockeying right now in Senate Democratic leadership. Uh, Senator Harry Reid from Nevada, the current Senate Minority Leader, the Democratic leader is retiring, and Senator Schumer from New York will be the next leader in all, all likelihood. There's been a lot of speculation that Senator Murray, the current Chief Democrat on the HELP Committee, which has jurisdiction of the FDA, is gonna run for, for whip or she could go chair another committee. You know, she's, the, their thing that she kind of is gonna do bigger and, you know, move on to bigger and better things, and she's a future party leader, maybe a future presidential candidate. So, their thing that she's gonna leave the help committee. Which means the next person in line at help committee to chair would be Senator Bernie Sanders. Now, I hear some groans in the crowd, and I agree. <laughs> I feel your pain, because it's gonna be painful. Um, uh, you know, Senator Sanders obviously got, came to national or international prominence uh, his, as a Democratic presidential candidate. He is a self-identified socialist. He is not a fan of the biotechnology industry, as we witnessed yesterday on the Senate floor um, when he railed against our industry for about 20 minutes. Um, and he would be next in line to be in charge of that committee. So if Republicans lose the Senate, there's a very good chance that Bernie Sanders is running help. And next year is a year where we have to reauthorize PDUFA. The agreement expires next September. So it could, it could be very tricky because we, we traditionally rely on the committee chairman to really ensure that there's a stable process that doesn't threaten the agreement. And I don't think that he's gonna hold himself to that usual standard of, of not undermining what the companies, the, the associations, bio and pharma, and the FDA have agreed to. So I think you take that potential into account when you also talk about the general environment on value of medicines and pricing, and it could make for a very, very volatile spring, and I'm sure I'll have more gray hairs when I see you guys next time. Well, um, you know, as we've seen the expansion, and, and there's also a lot of discussion right now about you know some of those things that we've gotta get done in the lane. I mean, We've got budget things, we've got reauthorization, we've got a, with the CR, we have, um, you know, a push towards finalizing some things that have been agreed to in this administration that could be at jeopardy in the next one. I mean, even SBIR, um, the medical device tax repeal, there's a lot of things that everybody's looking at right now and saying, this could be a really long Christmas season.
Yeah, so I think back it was 2011 or 2012, you know, I, I was in the Capitol on New Year's Eve and <laughs> getting emails at like three or four in the morning uh, New Year's Day about an, a, de a deal being hatched on the fiscal cliff and I, I think it could be a similar Christmas season. Uh, we'll see. As Joe mentioned, there are some things that need to get done. Um, there's obviously the omnibus or spending agreement that needs to get passed to fund the government. We're, we're likely to see the, the House and Senate agree to a continuing resolution to fund the government through December here in the next few days. What that means is that they're going to just take last year's funding agreement, erase the date, put in a new date for December, and the government says saves funding for three more months. We're then into December where we then have to pass another continuing resolution to keep funding the government or pass a, a spending, spending bill or pass the appropriations bills. Uh, there is talk in Congress of wanting to do individual appropriations bills or packages of appropriations bills. Traditionally, Republicans and conservatives really don't like doing omnibus spending deals. They, they view an omnibus as um, a way that we, a lot of times things get rammed through and get included that you know are not necessarily good good things, good policies. Uh, I think that feeling is shared by many Democrats as well, um, but they're just out of time. They've been unable to do the traditional appropriations process. So we're looking at you know definitely having an omnibus probably, definitely probably. I think there's a good chance we have an omnibus spending package in, in December um, where they just package all the appropriations bills together and move them. Then there's other priorities as well, and I think also it gets back to the election conversation. You'll have much different attitudes towards negotiating and bipartisanship, depending on what on what happens. Um, if you have a, a Clinton presidency, which I think is what most people are forecasting, and the Democrats win back the Senate, you know they may be loath to negotiate with Republicans because they'll be back in control. Then again, Republicans may also be willing to give up more because they won't have the gavels or be in control next year. So it really just depends. No one knows. I mean, I think the things that are teed up for lame duck, and this is just a smattering of potentials. There's a lot out there. One is TPP, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the president's you know, big trade deal he's been working on. It's a top priority for him. He's not been shy about saying that. Uh, these years, this year's election politics have really uh, put trade in a different light um, for both parties. You know, both you know, Mr. Trump and now Senator Clinton have both kind of come out against TPP. Uh, Senators on the campaign trail are, are, are campaigning against TPP, so the, I think there are some long odds there. Um, we aren't thrilled with what the biologics agreement turned out to be with the five plus three. Um, we don't think that's very strong, so we, we've been holding steady as well and saying that we really want to see some more work done on the biologics provisions. Uh, I was with my, a friend of mine is a lobbyist for the rice farmers. Everyone in DC has a lobbyist, so he lobbies for the rice growers. They're not happy either because of rice access to Japan and to Vietnam. Then you have the tobacco guys aren't happy. So there are a lot of folks in DC that are not happy with TPP. So I think that's going to be a tough one. Um, another thing is that there are some extenders and tax provisions that expire that need to be reauthorized. Some of those are energy related. Um, I don't do energy issues. My wife does. She said I should mention it for anyone in the crowd does energy. So um, another thing is the export import bank. Uh, we recently reauthorized the Export Import Bank, which is basically a, a lender to U.S. companies who do business abroad. Um, but one issue is that they don't have a quorum right now. They're down a member. Um, and Republicans in Congress don't want to authorize or appoint someone else to the bank because some Republicans want to kill the bank. Uh, so there's a, an issue with the bank not being able to approve certain size loans because they don't have a quorum. Uh, another issue is uh, judicial nominations. You know, we're going to see a big fight on that, I think, not only for Supreme Court, if the Democrats want to push through uh, the president's Supreme Court nominee because to fill Mr. Scalia's seat, uh, the late Justice Scalia's seat, but we're also a lot of federal circuit and district court vacancies available as well. Uh, and then, of course, you know, I think everyone's been following, there's been, you know, flooding in Louisiana and then also the Flint, Michigan, uh, lead contamination of the pipes. So both senators from those states Senators from both those states have been asking for additional funding to help their, their regions. So those are, that's just a, a taste of what will be fought over in the next couple months in lame duck. I think there, there is maybe an appetite for a big deal, uh, but to be seen. And of course, floating out there as well is cures. Because uh, we still haven't had a cures package pass the Senate. Uh, they've, they've been trying, uh, along with also mental health legislation and funding for opioids. So those are all things that are kind of floating around. So, you know, 
for not everybody is aware, you know, 21st Century Cures was a huge package. Um, not quite as big as the Affordable Care Act, but pretty close. Um, so when that moved over to the Senate and Senator Alexander looked at the pieces that he was responsible for, um, whereas energy and commerce covers everything affected by cures in the House, it's different in the Senate. So how is that different and why does HELP have to break it up into pieces? Sure. So the Energy and Commerce Committee has in the House, is it's one of the largest and most powerful committees in the House and, and probably than the entire Congress. Uh, it has massive, massive jurisdiction. Believe it or not, it actually also used to have financial services jurisdiction, and they broke that off and created a whole committee called the Financial Services Committee like 10, 15 years ago. So energy and commerce has jurisdiction over all energy, environment, commerce, healthcare, and telecommunications. On the healthcare side, they have the FDA, they have Medicare and Medicaid, they have the Public Health Service Act, and they have a few other cats and dogs. So they have a very broad healthcare jurisdiction. In the Senate, their committees are just organized differently. So the Senate Health Committee, where the, the Senate Cures Package is being debated, has a narrower jurisdiction than energy and commerce. They don't have any of the money stuff. They don't have anything that, that nothing related to related to spending is in HELP's jurisdiction. They have FDA, they have Public Health Service Act stuff, but they don't have Medicare, they don't have Medicaid. So the Cures Package did include some changes to Medicare and Medicaid, uh, especially when it came to some of the offsets, the pieces of the bill that save money. Uh, those are the Finance Committee's jurisdiction in the Senate. So it gets technical in the House. The House rules allow you to refer a bill to multiple committees. So in the House bill, the Cures really was also gonna get referred to Ways and Means. In the Senate, bills only get referred to one committee. So there are pieces of Cures in this, that have been referred to help, which actually are the Finance Committee's jurisdiction. And that's just because of that way they organize their committees. But it has created some, some, some friction because the Finance Committee guys, rightfully so, don't want to give up their jurisdiction on some of these issues. And they have their own priorities they want to get done. So that's kind of a dynamic for one, one of many reasons why, why it's taken a while for the Cures Package to move in the Senate. Okay. So, you know, as we look forward, and we've got a lot to do, what are some of the things that the people in this room can do to help really pay, you know, affect some of these key issues between now and the end of the year? Yeah, that's really important. Um, well, I think, you know, just kind of going back to Cures, I think that Cures does have a chance of getting done. You know, as, as Joe mentioned, uh, the Cures package that passed the House was very big. It was like a five or 600, 600 page bill. Um, we always kind of knew that the Senate wouldn't really take on that entire package and that they'd end up doing something more narrow. The Senate since has held their own process uh, through the HELP Committee called like, the Innovation Agenda process, where they vetted and, and uh, processed some of the bills that were, some of the parts of cures they went, that went through the HELP Committee as well. Uh, it's important to kind of focus on those pieces of, of cures that went through the Senate Health Committee. And I, I do think that we're, what we see in December as a kind of uh, compromise package of, you know, the House Cures Bill with the Senate Innovation Bill will be very similar to what the Health Committee worked on. So I think to the extent possible, you know, if you do have, interact with your member of Congress or you do interact with your, you know, your, your senator, if you can say how important getting that bill is, getting that bill done is, that's helpful. Um, but I think also honesty is important. You know, the, what Cures ended up becoming was a bill that went from being very, very strong on incentives for innovation with certain exclusivity periods, with other provisions that, was, that ended up being really watered down. And I, I hate to say that because I worked on it and, and Chairman Upton is my old boss and he's a great guy. Um, and those, the, the committee did a really fantastic job developing that package but we are now in a place where the, the bill's changed and there are forces and pressures to continually make it more narrow. So it's, it's really been more now of like an, almost like an NIH piece of legislation with, with some important minor incentives as well. So we, we do think that it's important to keep that in perspective. Um, so I think understanding what's in the, the package and understanding what could get done 
and, and, and you know, kind of being able to communicate the relative importance of those pieces to your congressmen and senators is important. So as we come up on the last 10 minutes of the hour, um, our industry has been in the news quite a bit over the last few months. Um, over the pricing decisions of some companies, not necessarily members of our industry, but companies who manufacture pharmaceutical products. Mm -hmm. um, and that sparked a conversation which has been uncomfortable at times, both with the candidates as well as with the press. What are some of the things that we need to be emphasizing um, you know, as those conversations continue, and they will continue. So that's something that we've obviously been focusing on a great deal at Bio um, in D.C. and with our and talking to our state affiliates. You know, we we hear about this a lot from Congress. Obviously, there is a con a concerted effort in Washington to really address uh, the perceived cost of drugs. Uh, you know, my first my first week on the job last year when I started at Bio was the week of the Turing uh, situation with Strickelli, uh when the Daraprims case really broke wide open. So it was <laughs> kind of been trial by fire for me, anyways. Um, and of course, Congress has been reacting, and, and it's sort of been one you know one thing after the other. There was the initial blowback from the Gilead Hep C you know price for her, for uh, their drug, and then you went to the Turing, and then Valiant, and then now EpiPen has kind of brought this all back up. Uh, so it's been in the news, it's been in Congress, you know, we are in election season, so they want to look like they're really doing something and really being responsive to constituent concerns. And you know, you are, they are, you know, I know people on the Hill are hearing from folks back home, from schools, they have to buy EpiPens now, they're saying, well, like, they're really expensive, they've gone up a lot in price, what are you going to do, why aren't you helping me? And then you have you know, the insurance industry and others that are kind of also co-opting this debate as a way to say, look, you know, we should be having price controls. We should be having ways to really clamp down on, on, on drug spending. So really, the, the onus has come to us, you know, to us and to pharma, saying, well, you know, what are we going to do? Like, are, we're, you know, how are we going to lead on this issue and really change the conversation and change the narrative? And I think we're doing a great, great job. You know, our CEO Jim Greenwood and our bio senior leadership has really focused on this issue, has been spending a lot of time developing a game plan and getting the buy-in from our member companies and, and really understand that we have a challenge ahead of us we need to address, and which is why Bio is launching a, a value campaign. You now we've really undertaken a whole process internally um, that focuses on telling our story, telling the story of biopharmaceutical innovation, of saving lives, of curing folks. Uh, on TV, at TV ads, you know, we have an ad called Life is Precious, which is really good on print media, you know, on internet, Facebook, all that. Also with a, you know, we have a blog that's updated regularly that goes, that gets sent around Washington. We have op-eds being placed in, in key papers. So we, I think, you know, the, the first thing is we're really trying to tell the story of innovation and, and really get beyond the initial, hey, look, it, it costs $1.5 billion in 10 years to develop a drug, you know, move the conversation forward to also saying, listen, here are the cures we're developing, here are the things that are being, you know, there's a new generation of, of therapies that weren't around before, here's what we're doing, here's what rebates are, here's how they work, you know, here's what the real list, uh, list price is versus what actually is being paid by the payers and by the patient, you know, and, and really not also shying away and, and answering tough questions, you know, we, we, we get emails all the time saying, hey, look, I, I just heard from someone say, you know, X, Y, Z, what's your response? And, and really trying to answer the tough questions and not have there be a vacuum uh, where we're not responding. You know, one thing is that the insurance lobby has been launching accusations about, you know, the Orphan Drug Act and how that's causing certain prices of drugs to go, to go way up. Well, we're responding to that. You know, Jim Greenwood had a blog post about that and saying, well, look, this is bunk. And this is what the real, this is why the orphan drug is, is working. And here's how many orphan drugs have come to market since the orphan drug was passed. So then that's another thing we're doing is really trying to like, not just sit back and, and, and take on the, the crisis, but really, you know, be proactive in responding. Um, you know, I think we're also setting the table to promote a positive conversation. You know, being for something is a lot, you know, better than being against something all the time. So we are talking about, you know, legislative ideas and how we can, you know, really focus on promoting the value of drugs and, and, and ensuring access to drugs and you know we've developed you know standards and principles and you know we're having board level conversations where that's the, that's the topic you know we spent three and a half hours at our last board meeting discussing this issue 
Um, and I think that the reality is that we need to, we need to be willing to offer proactive solutions and engage with Capitol Hill. Uh, that's that's really what we're doing a lot of is going to the Hill and doing education. You know, it, it's kind of interesting to think about. I think over half of Congress wasn't around when the Affordable Care Act was signed into law. So that's 2010, that's six years ago. Most members of Congress were not here in 2010. Now, go back to 03, who was, you know, how many members of Congress were around for Part D? Very few, very few. A handful. I mean, 10, 20, 30 maybe members in the House and Senate that were here when Part D was signed into law. You know, so it's really about, you know, educating members and going in and, ta and telling the whole story and being like, you know, here's what it was like before Part D. Here's why Part D is working. Here's how, you know, here's why the Part B demo is so harmful. You know, and just really going in and, and being willing to have a conversation where you're, that's based on facts. And I think the facts are on our side on this one. So we understand that, that the press isn't good and that we, there have been a lot of bad articles, but we're, I think <coughs> we're starting to turn the tide and, or stem the tide and then hopefully turn the narrative into a narrative that's talking about value and, and why, what we're doing proactively. You know, the Allergan CEO's recent comments really got a lot of great press. And, you know, also our, our, CEO, our board chairman, Ron Cohen, uh, the CEO of Accorda Therapies, has also been in the media uh, and been heavily quoted on, on, on that issue as well. So, you know, I, I, would, I would encourage all you guys to, to, follow the, to follow Bio's blog, to follow what we're saying, because we are really trying to turn the conversation around. That was great, Nick. Thank you. Um, guys, you just got the most up-to-date what's happening, you know, in Washington, and Nick flew in and got here at 2 o'clock so he could do this with you after leaving the Hill, and then has to turn around and go back. <laughs> what do you say? Now, the bar is going to be opening in a couple of minutes, but we've got Nick here. If you've got a couple of questions, we can ask him now. Okay, go ahead. Um, the Creating Hope Act uh, was part of the House package. Yeah. What's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? I'm really happy you brought that up. <laughs> it's funny, that's one of those things where I've been working on that night and day, and I knew I needed to talk about it, and I just left that out of my remarks. Sorry about that. Um, so the Creating Hope Act, for those of y'all who may not know, is uh, the reauthorization of the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher Program. We're just gonna go with RPD PRV, because I can't say that like 10 times fast. Um, it was initially included in the House Pass Cures Bill. Uh, it would have reauthorized the program through 2018. The Senate Innovation Package and the HELP Committee also had to create a version of the Creating Hope Act, which would have reauthorized the program through 2022 uh, to time it up with PDUFA. Uh, we like that better because it makes sense to have it right along in PDUFA. Um, that's sort of the background. When we realized that cures or innovations wasn't gonna get done before the program expires this September 30th, we really started working very hard with the champions in Congress to move something through the Senate and through the House as a standalone Creating Hope Act reauthorization before the expiration of the program. Yesterday in the Senate, um, Senator Johnny Isis from Georgia tried what's called a live unanimous consent request, which is rare. Um, what that essentially means is he went to the Senate floor, him and Senator Casey from Pennsylvania went to the Senate floor and asked in real time for the Senate to please call up and pass this important legislation because we're running out of time and the program expires. Senator Warren from Massachusetts and Senator Sanders from Vermont objected to that. They refused to let the reauthorization go through. Um, despite the fact that it's a program that has been hailed as a success by pediatric advocates, one that we think is an important incentive, um, they objected to letting it go through. And I think that's gonna like a taste of things to come for next year. I mean, it's, this is only gonna get worse. Uh, they did agree to, so what we were trying to get through was the five year reauthorization. Uh, they did agree to let a three month extension go through and say that they'll keep on working together uh, for the next couple months to see if we can you know, get the necessary changes to the program um, 
agreed to before they let a five year go through. So the good news is the program's not gonna expire at the end of the month. Um, it'll be ex extended through the end of the year. And then this will also be a lame duck issue as to what ends up happening on RPD, PRV. Uh, you know, I, I will say it, it's been uh, a very contentious issue more than it should be uh, because there, there have kind of been, a, you know, the, they've been talking about it in the context of all the PRV programs. So there's also one for neglected tropical diseases. And they've been saying, well, we should talk about all the PRV issues all at once. And, you know, we're not shying away from that conversation, but we aren't going to hold this program hostage and watch it expire while we sit around and try to figure out what's wrong with all the PRV programs. So I know it's an important thing to a lot of companies. We care about it a lot. We're, it's one of our top line lobbying priorities. We've been working on it literally night and day. Um, we're confident that the program will not lapse. Um, the, the version that was pat that extended actually has a, a definitional change that was important to certain companies to, to address a couple of diseases that weren't pro included in the uh, current version. So the change is going through Congress. We'll make some important changes to the definition. Um, and we're confident that come lame duck, we'll be able to get something, something through for a longer term. And what about FDA's pushback on it? So, if, you know, that's a good question. You know, the FDA is not a fan of the PRV program. They, they view it as, in some ways, folks paying for a voucher to get to the front of the line. Um, we don't agree with that. We think it's an important pull mechanism for getting folks to enter a space they otherwise wouldn't. Um, the FDA has not been shy about this criticism. They've been saying how they feel. Uh, luckily, uh, not to be partisan, but a lot of the Republican members in Congress don't much take he much heat into what the FDA is saying on this one. Um, it's a, wor a lot of it's a, 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 a workforce issue. I mean, it's, they, they see it as kind of a burdensome program. And, uh, you know, there are PRV fees that are paid when you use a PRV. Those fees can be changed. And the FDA has not engaged on why they won't change the fees or why they won't revisit a different fee structure. Um, that's a, a conversation that we, we've been willing to have and have been having. Um, so, it, yeah, the FDA is, doesn't like it, but I don't think that's going to kill the program. Okay, any other questions? All right, so there's one thing that Nick and I would like all of you to do. Actually, there's two. We're not going to tell you who to vote for, but it's tremendously important that we all vote. And this will probably be one of the most important elections from the presidency all the way down to every level. We're even you know, ex anticipating changes in our state house from this. So whichever way you lean, it's tremendously important that your voice be heard. Equally important, and here comes number two, is that um, when we send the emails out and say that we're going to D.C. for flying. We know we will have some new faces in the Arizona congressional delegation. Um, as well as, obviously, some new relationships because with all the changes, there's all new staff members. And Nick, as you know, you know staff are very, very important people to have relationships with. I mean, I know that some of y'all probably look at me and think I, I look pretty young, and you think I'm young, wait till you meet some of the staffers in Congress. I mean, I, I feel old compared to them, and it's important to, to go back there and really, you know, pound the shoe leather to meet them and talk to them, because at the end of the day, you know, I'm a DC hack. You guys are the constituents that they respond to, that, you, that, get, that, that elect them, that employ them. Your voice is important because they work for you, and don't let them forget it. Um, you know, and I will say that, you know, like I'm a Republican, I worked in Congress for Republicans, uh, but there are some great Democrats. And you know, Cinema from Arizona is a great member on our issues. She's been really helpful. She's been great. Um, and I encourage you guys to really follow your members, your, who your congresswoman is, your congressman is, your senator, and and, and see how they're doing on our on our issues, and then tell us. You know, my email is on the bio website. I I would encourage you guys to reach out and keep us posted. And if you have an idea or or have had a, mem a talk with your congressman and he is interested in our issues, tell us. Um, one of the value campaign things we've been doing is been going is kind of a road tour where Jim Greenwood has been going to uh, facilities in members' districts and having and you know giving them a tour and letting them learn about the companies that are in their backyard. 
Because you know we can talk about innovation and R and D and how expensive and how costly and risky it is, but until they go in there and like see what it, the, you know what it what it costs, what what the equipment costs, and what's going into it, it sometimes is hard to, to conceptualize. So I'd encourage you guys to be involved and to and to let us be part of the process with you and and stay in contact with us. And and I want to reiterate, um, you know, even if you're not from Arizona, um, you know, our state partners. Um, raise your hand, Kelly. And where's April? Oh, okay. Um, and Sharon? So we all go. When you come with us, it makes it so much more impactful. Because your stories matter. And when they can hear, I live in your district and I employ X number of people and together we're doing this you know, to help the state, to help the people, to help the patients. Those are the messages that really resonate. And with all of the important things that we have facing us in the coming months and in the coming years, um, it's not just Nick's voice or my voice or Jim Greenwood's voice or Steve Eubel's voice. It's all of our voices um, because together we can make the case for what's necessary to ensure that we can provide safe, effective, and available medicines for patients. So with that, shall we thank Nick? Thank you. You can just